Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. All right, it is my pleasure to introduce Emily Danton. Uh, Emily is currently a colleague. She's doing an internship uh, at the Facebook AI Research Lab. Uh, she is a PhD student uh, at NYU with Rob Burgess, and she has done a lot of work uh, on a variety of topics, for instance, compression of CNNs and uh, prediction of hashtags. And here she's going to talk about how to turn random numbers into beautiful images. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm Emily, and this is joint work with uh, Sumith, Arthur, and Rob at Facebook AI Research. So. What I'm going to be presenting today is a parametric generative model of natural images. The motivation for this work is the observation that it's very, very difficult to generate large natural images in one shot. Sort of current modeling approaches for images have a very difficult time scaling past sort of low resolution, simple images. So what we're going to do is exploit our domain knowledge that we have of natural images. And in particular, we're going to exploit their multi-scale structure. So the basic idea for this work is that we're going to break the problem of image generation down into a sequence of much more manageable subproblems. So first, we're going to care about just generating small, low-resolution images. So this is a very simple problem. 4 by 4 or 8 by 8 resolution is something easy to work with. Then we can learn a bunch of conditional generative models that generate a slightly higher-resolution version image conditioned on a lower-resolution res image. So we do this by combining a generative adversarial network learning framework with a Laplacian pyramid representation. So I'll now describe those two parts in turn. So generative adversarial networks are a recent generative modeling framework proposed by a good fellow et al uh, at last year's NIPS. And the idea here is that we're going to learn a generative model that learns to map from some noise distribution into image space, which I'm referring to as X. And the interesting thing about this model is that it's trained by introducing a discriminative model, and the two are going to be trained in opposition with one another. So the discriminative model, in our case, will be a neural network, and it's going to be trained to discriminate between real samples sampled from the data set, and this is depicted on, in this column here, and fake samples generated from our generative model. So the discriminative model is just a you know, binary classifier. And then the generative network is trained to fool the discriminator. So it wants to generate images that the discriminator thinks are real. So there's a, a recent extension of this work um, whereby an additional piece uh, of information is introduced to the generative network and the discriminative network. So for example, you could condition the generative process on a class label, in which case the generative network is asked to not only generate realistic images, but generate realistic images consistent with that class label. And you can condition on a variety of other things, as we'll discuss. So a Laplacian pyramid is an invertible multi-scale image representation. It's obtained by first constructing a Gaussian pyramid, which is illustrated in this top row here, and then computing a difference image between consecutive scales of the pyramid. So the result of this is a sequence of bandpass filtered images here and low pass filtered images. The Laplacian pyramid is then given by this single low frequency residual image and these bandpass filtered images. And then the original image can be uh, constructed, reconstructed exactly by simply adding in the high frequency information to the low frequency images. So what we're going to do in our work is we're going to learn a conditional generative model for each scale of the Laplacian pyramid. We're going to train a model to take as input a low resolution image and produce high frequency structure that's consistent with that image. So as I said, we're going to train this with this conditional generative adversarial network framework. So this image here is depicting training of one scale of the pyramid. So for all of the images in our data set, we're going to downsample them by a factor of two to get this low resolution image. We're then going to just blow it back up so it's the same size as the original image. We can compute the difference between those, and this gives us a ground truth sample, a, po a positive example for our discriminator. We then have this generative network, which takes as input a noise vector. In this case, we have it be the same dimensionality as the image. Uh, and we also give it the coarse resolution image. And it's trained to produce some high frequency structure that hopefully is going to be consistent with this low resolution image. And the discriminator takes in either the real high frequency structure or the fake high frequency structure along with the coarse resolution image, and it has to determine whether it's real or fake. So we train this model for each level of the Laplacian pyramid. And they're all trained completely independently. So this means that no gradient information is propagated from one level of the pyramid to another. 
So sampling in this model is very, very simple, uh, and it's akin to reconstructing an Laplacian pyramid. So we take our first level uh, generative adversarial network. It's not conditioned on anything because it's the first level. It takes in a noise vector as input and produces a low resolution image as output. We then pass that low resolution image into this next generative adversarial network, which produces high frequency structure that's consistent with this low resolution image. We then add those two together to get a higher resolution image, which then becomes the input to the next generative adversarial network. And this procedure is continued uh, until we have an image of the desired resolution. Okay, so we trained this model on a variety of different data sets. Uh, the simplest experiment that we did was on CIFAR, which is a, a small data set of 10 different classes. Uh, we use convolutional neural networks for both the discriminator and the generator. Um, and uh, these models were quite small because CIFAR is a, is a pretty small data set. So we also conditioned in these models on a one-hot encoding of the class label. So this means that we can then sample from the model for a particular class. So these are some examples of ship samples from the, from the CIFAR model. Um, and these, these, the, the visual quality of these samples uh, compares favorably to other sort of models trained on these data sets. Um, we see we get sort of sharpened edges. Some images look like plausible boats. Other ones you can see some artifacts. Again, here are some horse samples. Um, and similarly, you see sort of sharp object-like structure. Um, but there's you know, a clear ways to go before we have perfect models. So then we also trained uh, a couple models on the LSUN data set. So this is more interesting because this is a much larger data set of scenes, and so we were able to train uh, quite large and deep convolutional neural networks. So these models have uh, five convolutional layers in the generator um, and three in the discriminator. And so for this, we trained different models uh, for different scenes. So I'm going to show you some samples from models trained on towers and churches. So what this is depicting here is the course define generation chain. So the way you read this is this first column here shows a four by four sample from the coarsest level generative model. And then we condition the second generative model on these low resolution images and we generate something of resolution eight by eight. We then condition and get 16 by 16 and so on. And you can see that this is, this is just one example of a high resolution image that could be generated from this low resolution image. Because there is this stochasticity in the networks, we can generate a variety of different images given you know, a lower resolution one. So we can look at what these samples look like. Uh, so this is, these are a bunch of random samples uh, from a model trained on churches. And we can see that they're, uh, these are 64 by 64. So the, the, I should say these are, these are larger resolution um, than previous models uh, were able to achieve. Um, and you can see you know, there's a fair amount of uh, variability in the images. Um, and there's a lot of sort of detailed structure. And from far away, they look like churches. If you look up close, you'll see little warped, warped images. But they're, 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 fairly, they're fairly realistic um, uh, images. So another thing that we might want to do with our model is sort of probe you know, what kinds of uh, variability the model has learned. And so to test this, what we did was we sampled a single low resolution image from our coarsest model. And then we conditioned the generation process on that image. So that's what's shown here in the leftmost column. And then all subsequent columns here show different samples from the model. So different random noise vectors are injected into the model to get different, coarse resolu or different high resolution images that are all consistent with this low resolution image. Um, and what's interesting here is that you see uh, that the network has learned uh, all sorts of different you know, structures uh, about towers and churches. So uh, if, if our model is simply learning a, a lookup table, for example, you would see you know, very, very slight variants of the, of the original image. But we do, in fact, see sort of towers being added and removed um, you know, in different sort of variants of semi-realistic church images. So another thing that we can do, uh, which I'm going to illustrate in this video, which it might have a little bit of trouble buffering initially, but bear with me. Um, so what we can do here is, uh, is see what kind of manifold of images our model has learned. So what I'm going to show you is uh, in this corner here, we're going to have we're going to be traversing a path in the space of four by four images, and then this this section here will show a 16 by 16 image generated conditioned on that four by four, and this shows the 64 by 64 version of it. So give it a second while it buffers, um, it'll start to look more realistic. Um, but this can what, what you should be noticing here is that the there it goes the images are sort of varying smoothly. Um, and we do sort of see church images at, at every point. We see sort of you know, different churches morphing into different churches. Um, 
but it's varying smoothly as we, as we traverse this, this low resolution space. Um, and you can do different sorts of variants of this, um, and we have, we have some demos online that show different sorts of ways to probe these models. So, okay, almost done. So generative adversarial networks um, are wonderful, powerful models, but they, uh, they're very finicky to train, and there's lots of instability issues. And so very recently, uh, in the past couple weeks or so, a paper's come online um, by Radford, Metz, and Chantala, and uh, this is a very nice paper, and it proposes a bunch of tricks to stabilize the generative adversarial network training process. Um, and so they use these tricks, and they train very deep models. And these are not our conditional Laplacian pyramid models. These are just standard generative adversarial network models. And they get quite high quality samples. So these are just an example of bedrooms. They train on a variety of other data sets. Um, but the, the samples look very, very nice. So something nice about this is that uh, the techniques that they propose are orthogonal uh, to our work. So you know, some future work for us will be to combine those tricks into the training of our generative adversarial networks at each level of the pyramid to hopefully produce even higher quality um, and higher resolution images. So, to summarize, um, we've proposed a very simple model that is able to exploit our domain knowledge of images. Um, and there is a variety of sort of ways this, this model could be used. Um, for example, it could be used as a decoder in an autoencoding framework um, for unsupervised learning. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of future work to be done to, to make these models more stable and easier to train, but people are sort of looking into this. So, if you want to uh, look at our code, uh, try it out, um, or see some more examples, uh, you can go to this website here. Thanks. Diamond. Thank you. This is a very elegant combination of two solid ideas. I like it a lot. I'm wondering if they are sufficiently or orthogonal indeed that you could replace the, uh, the generative system by, for example, a conditional energy-based model or some other generative systems. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I don't think that a generative adversarial network is the only generative model that we could use here. It's the only one that we sort of thoroughly explored, um, and it sort of made sense to try out because generative adversarial networks produce these sort of nice, sharp images that you, you often see other sort of generative models blurring things out. Uh, and in our case, we wanted really nice, sharp images, so, so generative adversarial networks were a nice approach. But that being said, um, you know, any sort of really powerful condition generative model should be, you know, able to be plugged into this into this method, and that would be a very interesting interesting thing to explore. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Um, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so I feel like um, the success of the generative model depends a lot on the discriminative model, and so to train it, you need uh, real images and generated images, but then you need the generative model to train uh, to generate the synthetic images, so is that kind of a chicken and egg problem, or? Um, sort of, and I mean, that's, that's kind of the way that it's trained. So initially, the generative model is going to produce, you know, garbage images. It's taking a random vector as input, and it's, you know, it's a random, randomly initialized neural network, so it'll produce total garbage. Uh, and the discriminative network sort of over time starts to learn, okay, you know, this is the structure of a real image, this is what is a fake image, and then the generator has to get a little bit better. Uh, and so they really do sort of, you know, cycle back upon one another. Um, and there are lots of, you know, interdependencies between the two. If your discriminator is, you know, too powerful early on, then it will be very hard to, for the generator to, you know, learn anything interesting. Um, so there definitely is a very, um, very strong and important interplay between the two of them during training. Okay. Thanks. Any other question? Okay, so let's thank Emily again. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.